This week, we'll be exploring unsolved mysteries that range from the tragic murders of the Dumbler family in their own home, to the identity of this old man robbing banks, appropriately named the Geezer Bandit, to the heartbreaking case of these three girls who went missing while out shopping in Fort Worth. We will explore all of these and more, so grab a drink, my choice today is chai, and join me as we explore the unsolved mysteries iceberg. The double murder in Shenandoah National Park. So this was an unsolved, seemingly senseless murder of two women in 1996. Julian Williams and Laura Winans were a young couple who were just huge fans of the outdoors, of hiking, and at the time they were on a trip in the wilderness near the Shenandoah's Skyland Resort in 1996. The two were a lesbian couple who had met just two years earlier, and Julianne in particular was trying to reconcile being a lesbian with being a Christian. As in her head, these were two things that she felt very strongly about, and she was working incredibly hard at trying to integrate them. And she actually started a church group called Church Ladies to try and help and make other gay and lesbian people joining her church feel more loved, more cared for, more understood, more welcome. And she actually met Laura not in this group, but in a group called Woods Women, which was designed basically as like a women's outdoor group. You know, they would go on treks, they would go on hikes, and as I said, at the time, the couple were out hiking, camping, along with their pet dog, Taj. And all of a sudden, they just went missing. Soon after, there was obviously a search started. And initially, they found the women's dog. And soon after somewhat nearby, they found the bodies of both Laura and Julianne. And it was not a pretty scene. Both women had been stripped down, they were bound, they were gagged, and they had their throats slit. And tragically enough, the two women were only out on this hike to actually celebrate Julianne getting a new job. Now, after the initial shock of the discovery, there were quite a few questions surrounding this case about who attacked them, why they attacked them, whether it was just an unlucky spur of the moment sort of attack, or whether these women were hunted and targeted. Was the targeting random or was it because of, say, their sexuality? Was this the work of a serial killer or was this just an isolated incident? A lot of questions. Now, the evidence for this one was very, very sparse. As I said, they were basically in the woods with no cameras, no evidence, no footage, no witnesses. And the only real evidence that they found was from the duct tape that was used to bind the women. And on this duct tape, they found some male hairs that actually matched somewhat the DNA of a serial killer named Richard Evanitz. The match wasn't like 100% or completely definitive. It was like, ah, that's kind of close to him, I guess. And so the FBI asked that these tests be done again to double check things to try and run it through, but they never were. Richard died just a few years after this, and so he was never charged for these killings. And that is basically where the investigation ended. They're still receiving the odd tip here and there, and the case is still open, but it's now been almost 30 years in a cold case with no real leads or suspects. Hopefully something comes up soon, but just to be brutally honest, it doesn't look like it will. The Dumbler family was a brutal case involving three members of the Dumbler family. On October 22nd, 1969, an unidentified person was in the Dumbler's home, which they got into seemingly somehow, as there was no signs of forced entry or breaking and entering, so it seems like either they were let in or they snuck in somehow. And they took Martin and Patricia Dumbler and Patricia's mother upstairs before tying them all up and shooting them to death. The killer then untied the three victims, left the house, and came back around an hour later and stabbed Martin and Patricia in the chest with a knife. So just an insane incident, horrifically brutal, and especially coming back after they were dead to apparently do more damage, to finish the job. Like, it's really messed up. The couple's two kids, who were both children, were sleeping at the time downstairs, and they didn't wake up while all of this was going on, and thankfully they weren't attacked or hurt during all of this. This part honestly made me tear up a little bit while reading it, but the murders were actually discovered when the two children, aged just four and five, ran out to a neighbor's house the next morning and said that they couldn't wake up mummy and daddy, which it just 
breaks my heart to imagine children going through something like this. There was very little evidence for this one. The scene was almost completely clean of DNA. There were no witnesses. As I said, there was no sign of forced entry into the house. Nothing either in the house or on the victims was missing. So it doesn't seem like a robbery was very likely. And during the police investigation, they interviewed hundreds of witnesses. They conducted polygraphs, followed up on dozens and dozens of tips and suggestions, and still no obvious suspect stood out. I say no obvious suspect, but there were some suspects. One was a relative of Martin's who worked in the same paper company that Martin was just about to inherit from his father. And another was a man who belonged to the same country club as Martin, who some of Martin's family members saw this man as quite suspicious. And that's kind of as far as they got. No one was ever charged with these killings. The case is 55 years old at this point, and it doesn't seem likely to be solved really anytime soon. But as I said, thank God that the children in this weren't harmed. But it still must have been pretty rough for them to have gone through this. The Dunedin bombing is a very strange, mysterious case. It involved the lawyer James Patrick Ward in Dunedin, New Zealand. And he was facing an appeal at the time. And when asked how the appeal was going by a colleague, he told them that he would most likely definitely win the appeal unless... I don't know, he got a bomb in the mail the next morning or something. And the next morning, he literally got a bomb in the mail. The package was delivered, it was handed to him, and at 9am while in his office, he opened the package and it exploded. His left hand was completely obliterated and he suffered severe damage to his chest and upper body. He was of course rushed to hospital, but sadly he died the same day. There was no apparent or obvious motive for this one, but there clearly must have been some motive for someone to plan this, build the bomb, send it out, and potentially and actually kill someone. Like, there must have been some reason. James was described as a bit difficult to work with, but then again, he was a lawyer, so that's not really saying much. He had some enemies, but again, he was a lawyer, so that is not too unusual. But none that hated him enough to literally send a freaking bomb in the post to him. The parcel itself was a wooden box filled with plastic explosives with an electric trigger and a detonator. James's brother-in-law, John, was a major suspect in this case, as he quite openly hated James and had experience during World War II of making bombs. And also, also, he had a history of being a little bit mentally unstable. But whoever sent the bomb, whether it was John, was incredibly careful about leaving any evidence at all. And so, because John denied everything in the interviews that he had, the police had no real evidence to pin this on him. And so, John was never charged. It has been over 60 years since this incident happened. And aside from the case being extremely deadly and brutal. What really stands out is James seemingly predicting his own death and predicting receiving a bomb in the mail, which is all sorts of weird, whether it was just sheer luck or sheer bad luck, or maybe somehow he knew about the plot, which to me doesn't really seem likely, but it is what it is. The 2024 subscriber case is the unsolved mystery of why you are not subscribed. It's the best way to stay notified of all the new mystery videos, iceberg videos, and many more that will be coming in the next few months. And you get us one step closer to our goal of 108 billion subscribers. So hit the red button and join the family. Dwayne McCorkendale was the case of a man found dead at a highway rest stop in Oklahoma in 1988. At around 8 p.m. someone called in the body found just next to a phone booth. And when police arrived, they determined it to be the body of 27-year-old truck driver, Dwayne McCorkendale. He had apparently been robbed. His manner of death was a shotgun blast close range to the back. And there were no witnesses or suspects. And police first suspected that the killer may have actually stalked Dwayne here to this particular rest stop and phone booth. As according to other truck drivers in the area, Dwayne was chatting away to other drivers on his radio and he mentioned that he was going to stop off at this particular truck stop and call his wife. So police thought someone may have been in the area, had one of these radios, heard Dwayne say in this and then decided to ambush him. So that was something that they were on the lookout for. So after announcing his plan on the radio, Dwayne stopped off 
at this rest stop, got out of his truck, went to the phone booth, and took out some change, ready to make a call. When, apparently, suddenly, without even having time to turn around, Dwayne was shot from behind with a shotgun, and according to the investigators, he was dead before he even hit the ground. The change that he had in his hand was just strewn everywhere, his wallet and his keys were taken, and the value totaled up to like $25, which killing for this amount is just an absurdity. I mean, killing for any amount is, but this amount especially. And the fact that he was shot so quickly and from behind means likely that the people didn't ask him for anything, as you know, he would have probably turned around. There probably wasn't an altercation or a fight. It seems like it was just a instant killing. And eventually they came to the conclusion that one of the major suspects for this case wasn't a person, but rather a car. So when the investigation started and the calls were opened up for people to, you know, report sightings, report tips. Quite a few calls came in about a brown Ford Pinto that was apparently equipped with a trucker's CB radio and was being an absolute menace on and around the roads roughly in this area. This brown Pinto would apparently be driving super erratically. They would be tailgating trucks and other cars, swerving in and out of lanes incredibly quickly, and sometimes truckers would, you know, turn on the radio, try and have a word with them, you know, to say, relax, you're driving insanely, like you're honestly gonna get someone killed. And they would get replies from the Brown Pinto saying like, watch who you're talking to, you don't know who you're messing with. We have killed one trucker and we will kill again if you get in our way. The people in this car were reported to be one black male, one white male, and sometimes a white woman with them. And these were seen as the main prime suspects. But they were never found, they were never identified, nor was the car, and so the people were never investigated or interviewed. A few other truckers apparently had some kind of close calls with this brown pinto before, you know, it sped off never to be seen again. But as I said, the people and the car were never identified, and Dwayne's seemingly senseless murder was never solved. The Edgecombe County Serial Killer. So this was a serial killer thought to be connected to up to 11 victims between 2005 and 2009. They were all involved in, you know, adult work and all had various problems with addiction. So once again, very sad to see these troubled, vulnerable women being taken advantage of in this most extreme way possible, you know, being killed. And in this investigation, there wasn't really too much evidence to be found, but they did find male evidence on one of the victims, Tara Nicholson, and they eventually linked this DNA to a man named Antoine Pittman, who was a convicted felon living relatively nearby. He was eventually convicted and charged for the death of Taraha Nicholson, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. But he never was, nor was anyone else, charged for these other 10 murders. And police do think that they are all linked to one killer. And so, you know, if Antoine committed one of these murders, at least police think he likely committed the others. But he was never officially linked to them. And so the cases of these 10 other women sadly remain unsolved. Emily Sage's ghost twin. And that last name is a little funny. I'm not too sure how to say it. Might be Sage, might be Sage, might be Segui, but we'll just go with Sage. So we go from provable, tangible, physical murders to, well, whatever this case is. Emily Sage was a school teacher who had been teaching for 16 years in Europe in the 1800s. She apparently, according to reports at the time, was haunted by a mirror image of herself for many, many years. Students would sometimes report seeing Miss Sage up on the blackboard, you know, writing something out, but also see a mirror image right next to her, seemingly mirroring everything everything that she did. They would say they saw Miss Sage out in the garden picking flowers, say, whilst also at the exact same time see her sitting in a chair in her classroom. And when they went into the classroom to try and touch Miss Sage, their hands went straight through as if she was an apparition of some sort, and eventually she then disappeared. This all terribly frightened the kids. There were rumors of her being haunted by a, you know, mirror, doppelganger, ghost sort of thing, or of her being able to project her image somehow, you know, like appearing in two different places at the same time. But either way, the kids, the students, started to tell their parents, and then the parents 
parents started to slowly take them all out of school. And eventually, only 12 of the 42 students in school were still attending. So because of this, and because of the reports, the principal of the school was really left with no choice but to fire Miss Sage. And when they fired her, she actually revealed that she had worked in 19 schools over the last 16 years, which is obviously more than one new school every single year. She was apparently shocked, like, this keeps happening, but she was quite used to it by now. After this, she left the school, but was never seen from again. She was a very mysterious figure, and due to some discrepancies in the records, there were rumors about whether she herself were a ghost, or whether she was just hard to pinpoint as maybe she had changed her name quite a few times over the years, as, you know, being fired 19 times in 16 years isn't really a great look for your record. So, Honestly, who really knows? But I think, at least for me, it is a very fun, classic, traditional mystery sort of story that I am always a huge fan of. Flyby Anomalies is a pretty basic one. It's essentially a discrepancy or difference between the speed we'd predict a spacecraft to be going and the actual speed that we measure it at. The differences are honestly quite minimal, and I think it could come down to a miscalculation in the prediction or a miscalculation calculation in the measurement of the speed, but I guess it is technically a mystery as to what causes this discrepancy. Not a great one, but there you go. The Fort Worth Missing Trio. So this was a trio, these three girls, who went missing in 1974, Texas. These three girls were Mary Rachel Trelitza, Lisa Renee Wilson, and Julie Ann Mosley, aged 17, 14, and 9, respectively. It was 1974, and the three girls were out Christmas shopping, and they went to the Seminary South Shopping Center to buy clothes and Christmas gifts. They arrived at the mall at around noon and planned to be home at no later than four o'clock. Many witnesses saw the three girls in the mall on the day and they seemed to be just fine, happily shopping, and they weren't with anyone else. But when the three girls didn't arrive home, their parents naturally went looking for them, and when they went to the mall, they found the car that the girls had arrived there in, driven by the older girl, but the three girls were nowhere to be seen. Strangely enough, the clothes and the gifts and the bags that the girls had bought were all in the car, so it seems very likely that the girls had at least made it this far back before whatever happened happened. The parents waited all night in the car park beside the car for the girls to return, but they never did. The police were obviously called and initially they thought the girls might have run away. A letter was sent by apparently Rachel to her husband Tommy and yes she was only 17 but she was married at the time and Tommy received the letter the day after the disappearance and I said earlier it was apparently from Rachel because even though it was signed off with love Rachel, there were a few things which were a little bit off about the letter. The letter itself was written in ink and was quite a bit wider than the envelope, and the stuff on the envelope was written in pencil. The letter was addressed to Thomas, as opposed to the more informal Tommy that Rachel normally called him. Some of the names, the words, the zip code of the letter were either incorrect or written over or mistaken, and the whole thing seemed a bit strange. But that's kind of as far as the letter went as both the FBI and law enforcement weren't actually ever really to determine whether Rachel had written this letter, or whether it was written by someone else, or who that someone else might have been. The families of the girls, it should be noted, believed that Rachel did not write this letter, and that the three girls did not run away. And they worked, understandably, absolutely tirelessly over the years, raising money for rewards, organizing searches, collecting tips, and they even hired a private investigator, the Detective John Swain. He found a few more witnesses over the years. One guy worked in a store that Rachel had apparently applied for a job at, and this guy was found to have been taking phone numbers from job applications of young women applying and anonymously harassing them with phone calls that were quite creepy and inappropriate, which is obviously wrong and creepy, but he was ruled out as a suspect for the murders. There were other reports of the girls being seen in different places, which when investigated just turned out not to be the girls. There were reports of murders taking place, of bodies being found, and when these were investigated they were either different bodies, so not the girls, or they were mistaken events or just prank calls, and the girls were, even after all of these years, never found. 
around. Years later, a few second-hand witnesses came forward. So, you know, these people didn't witness the girls going missing, but they knew someone who said something about someone else they knew. So like a witness that's basically untraceable. And they said that they saw these men forcing the girls into a yellow truck in the parking lot. So, you know, either these reports are false, but even then it's like, why make something like this up? Or they're real, in which case, why in the fuck would they not have come forward with this sooner? Those reports never really went anywhere, and so that is where the case remains to this day. John Swaim later died in 1979 and ordered that upon his death, all records and tips and stuff that he received in regards to this case be destroyed, which I don't know why you'd want to destroy them. Like surely you'd want as much evidence and information out there to help find these girls. But that is where it sits to this day. Fullerton John Doe. So this was an unidentified man who died in traffic in 1987. This was in Orange County, California. He was roughly 30 to 40 years Years old, six feet tall, and he had no identification on him. They ran his dental records, they ran his fingerprints, but received no matches, and so he was listed as a John Doe. Not much on this one, but there you go. Gary DeVore was an American screenwriter who went missing in 1997 during a night drive home. He was, as writers tend to be, a bit quirky, a bit creative, a bit unusual and witty, and he was working on a script late into the night at his office in Santa Fe. And once he was done for the night, he headed home to Santa Barbara, which was like a 14-hour drive, which is just bonkers. But apparently he liked the change of environment, he liked having his office away from his home, away from his town, away from his community, somewhere that he could, you know, really get away and focus on the writing, which, I mean, is understandable. But his wife was waiting in Santa Barbara for him to return, and when he didn't, she called him. He said he was still on his way, but didn't really give an exact location. And this is the last time that he was ever heard from. Searches were done, nothing was found. But a year later, both Gary and his vehicle were found submerged below a bridge in Palmdale, California. When police pulled the car out of the water, they found that Gary's laptop was missing, which contained on it the script that he was writing, and his personal firearm was missing. And I think most strangely of all, both of his hands were also missing. Now, what's strange about this? Well, there are a few things that are strange about this, but firstly, the car's headlights weren't turned on, like they weren't set to the on switch, which is a bit weird if you're driving at night. Secondly, these waters were actually checked shortly after Gary's disappearance, but back then nothing was found, which is a bit strange. Thirdly, police said that in order for Gary to have driven off this bridge, he would have had to have gotten onto this road and driven for roughly three miles in the wrong direction, which would have been against oncoming traffic, but no one had reported seeing Gary or a car doing something like this on the night. And if he had been driving the wrong way and a car, you know, had come towards him and startled him and then he panicked and swerved off the bridge, which I think is what it looks like or was made to look like, then surely this other oncoming driver would have witnessed this, would have reported something like this. And fourthly, obviously, he had no hands, which I don't know how that even happens. This is as far as the investigation went and whether it was just a sheer unlucky accident or maybe some sort of targeted hit, we at least currently, don't really know. The Giza Bandit is a bit of a strange one. So the term Giza is British slang for a man, but more often a old man. And this bandit or bank robber was known as the Giza Bandit because I mean, look at him. He's a geezer. He is wanted for committing at least 11 bank robberies, but possibly up to 16, in California between 2009 and 2011. He is thought to be around 60 to 70 years old, around 6 feet tall, and his MO was to walk into the bank as normal, go up to the teller as normal, and give them a note saying something to the effect of, give me $50,000 or I will murder you, which is not normal. He is, or at least was, on the FBI's top 10 list, and had a $20,000 reward set for anyone with any information leading to his arrest. And there were actually some theories that the Giza bandit was actually a younger man wearing a fake rubber plastic mask. This theory originated when video footage of the Giza bandit came out, showing the man move quite sprightly for a man of his age. And so people started to think that 
that maybe it was a younger man wearing a very convincing latex mask, which honestly is certainly a possibility. So a bit of a strange one. He never killed or really hurt people during these robberies, but he is still a wanted and potentially dangerous man. The German Headless Horse. So this was the remains found of a horse from 1400 years ago, which didn't have a head. It was found in southern Germany in a cemetery and was found next to the remains of a man who did have his head and he was thought to be the rider or owner of this horse. The deaths and burials of these two happened during the Merovingian dynasty and the man was thought to be somewhat high up in the king's command at the time, which is all well and good, but just exactly why this horse was buried without a head or why its head was you know, bloody chopped off prior to it being buried, is still a mystery. It might have been a ritual of some kind or something like that. Or maybe the horse just got in an accident, lost its head, and was buried alongside its owner. We really don't know, but either way, poor horse. The ghost gunshot was a case in Switzerland where this man was just walking along, him and his two children, when suddenly he felt a pain in one of his legs. This was a sharp, intense pain. He had no idea where it was coming from or what caused it. And so he immediately went to the emergency room and they informed him that he had been shot. They found a small projectile in him, so they removed it, treated the wound and sent him on his way. He never heard the shot, he didn't know where it came from, and obviously wasn't really thinking that at all as he had to be told by the doctors that he had actually been shot. When police were later investigating this incident, they thought that it might have been a negligent firing of a gun. You know, maybe from someone far away using a weaker rifle, firing at a target, missing, and then the bullets traveling more and more and more, getting slower and less powerful over time and eventually randomly embedding it into this guy's leg. They said it was low enough of a caliber to not really do too much damage, that it was far away enough so that this guy didn't actually hear the firing of it, and it wasn't thought to be a hit or deliberate attack or anything like that, but rather just sheer negligence. They never did find out who fired it or where it came from, but it is kind of a wild story. And that is all we have time for. I really hope you enjoyed this one, guys. There were some very tragic cases, some very interesting ones, some very mysterious ones. But as always, thanks for watching.